Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, before we do anything, the most important thing, silence your cell phones, however you like to silence. So, one announcement before we begin is that Joe's wonderful book, for any of you who haven't purchased it and would like to, is available for sale um, in the back of the hall. My name is Ira Wood, and I'm honored to be your MC today. Um, I just want to say that Joe Gouveia was a dear friend of ours, and Joe was so many things to so many people, and I believe he was cherished by everyone here, cherished as a friend, as a husband, as a poet, as a son, as a father, a student, a brother, and even as a skilled carpenter. The first time I heard Joe Gouveia's name ever was on the answering machine. The answering machine said, hi, this is Joe Gouveia. I'd like to know if you'd like to go to dinner at Maya Angelou's house next week. <laughs> so Marge and I looked at each other and said, sure, go to dinner at Maya Angelou's house, but who's Joe Gouveia? <laughs> A couple of days later, the answering machine was uh, beeping again when we got home, and the voice was, Hello, this is Maya Angelo. <laughs> I'm so glad you'll be coming to my home, and I wanted to give you directions. But who is Joe Gouveia? <laughs> Joe Gouveia, to me, more than all the things that I mentioned, was a connector. Joe loved, more than anything, bringing people together. And that is the reason that we're all together here. And if we have nothing in common, it's that we all love Joe Gouveia. So there are 16 talented poets honoring and entertaining you today. And while that is a great blessing, it is also a great responsibility for the poets. So unfortunately, although each of these wonderful poets could entertain you for an entire evening on their own, we're going to ask each one to limit themselves to five minutes. And I have the unfortunate responsibility to signal people after five minutes, but I will not be alone. I have my smartphone and Paul McCartney, who after five minutes will start singing Good Day Sunshine. <laughs> so when you hear Good Day Sunshine, please get off the stage and make room for somebody else. <laughs> Joe, I'm, one of the things that I do in my life is that I'm a, a DJ, a spoken word host on WOMR radio station in Provincetown. And WOMR, as all of you know, uh, was fortunate to have Joe as the host of this wonderful poetry show for many, many years. And also, Joe was the, uh, he started this great national poetry contest, which I would like to announce for all of you who don't know, will now and forever henceforth into the future be called the Joe Gouveia Poetry Contest. <laughs> Our first speaker will be the person who is the director of this wonderful cultural center, Lauren Wolk. Sometimes, but, uh, 
but, but <laughs> he couldn't be angry at that man. Um, he was like part puppy, part little boy, part amazing poet, part really strong man, but always, always, no matter what he did, gentle. Always gentle. And that I love about him, among other things. That's all I'm going to say today because we have a lot ahead of us. I'd simply like to introduce now um, Joe's sister, Elizabeth, to come up and say a few words to the family. Thank you, Lauren. I've watched so many videos of Joe reading his poems, many of them right here in this room. And it comes to mind one in particular where he approaches the podium, bends over, rolls up his jeans, pulls his poem out of his boot, and he stands back up and notices that the audience is chuckling, and he says, what, you don't see poetry in your boot? <laughs> <laughs> when I first marked this event on my calendar, I couldn't help but note that Joe's 50th birthday today would fall on the day we turned the clock back. How coincidental and how poetic. How we all wish we could turn it back to more than an hour. On behalf of the entire Bovea family, we wish to express our deepest gratitude to Martina Spada for organizing this event with Lauren Wolf, the director of the Cultural Center, and Chase Bergram, who, as Joe said, was like a son to him. We'd like to thank the Cultural Center for hosting the event and all those who helped promote it. Thank you to all the poets who will be reading today and all those who offer to read. We'd like to thank Maritza Rivera of Casa Mariposa Press, who's also reading today, for publishing Joe's book, Sadavish, and making it reality, getting it to print while he was still with us. Finally, thank you to all of you who traveled from far and near to be here today. I can think of no better way to celebrate Joe's beautiful spirit than through the poetry that he so loved to which he blossomed, and to which he was so passionately devoted. I don't have a poem in my boot, but I do have a haiku in my hand. My nephew, Matthew Freas, is living overseas and asked that I share this with you all, which he wrote for Joe. Jogo went and saw, caressing life fearlessly. He died a legend. Thank you again, and please honor Joe every day by embracing life as he did, by living life to the fullest, being true to oneself, and never holding back. For though he lived a short life, he knew joy, fulfillment, triumph, and most of all, love. In the words of Walt Whitman, one of Joe's favorite poets, do not weep for me, this is not my true country. I now go back there. I return to the celestial sphere where everyone goes in his turn. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday, Joey. Hamu Sadavish. I'm John Landry from San Jose, California. Martin came out in June. Thank you. 
appeared in John Rani's first issue, the Cape Cod Review. I'm not going to want to time this, I'm sorry about the dragging away with major points. Well, you know what? He's going to have fun. So this one is for herself. This is called the diffusion. Since we're here to enjoy the diffusion. The diffusion by Joe Bonaire. She was soft, light, smooth, diffuse, with few shadows. She, he was hard light, creating bright and dark areas simultaneously. His point source was the sun, a direct light producing dark shadows where he liked to hide. Her light, her light source illuminated in several directions, exposing all coming from the entire dome of the sky. From the number of smaller suns, not just the big one, he would like one. His sharpened, leaving crisp edges and distinguished differences. She was less black and white, a broad light wrapping completely around her subject. Early and late in the day, she had a warm golden glow. Frigid temperatures found her more bluish with a more noontime shade. Partially obscured by reflective atmospheric light, he used his darker shadows as design elements, used her bright subject against his very dark background, softening the scene with fill flash whenever within range. The effect was emphasized by increasing exposure on hazy days. When overcast, interior rooms would flood with her more even light. The light, excuse me. When overcast, interior rooms would flood with her more even lighting, bouncing off the walls and ceiling. His hard edged shadows crisply outlined details, almost forming an abstraction. Always having to choose between properly rendered highlights or shadows, he created contrast with his light that came from one direction. Her diffusion softened his colors and texture, making his shadows indistinct, lessening the limited range between the darkness and the light. How much time do I have?
best friend, my father. Um, this poem from his beautiful book is entitled Taking Our Breath Without Permission. In the realm of flesh, where animal instincts drive Mother Nature's will in a forest waiting to burn, only our wetness keeps us alive. Facing love's finale in a thicket of wilting rosebuds, squirrels still scattered from nuts, away from Spanish moss drooping from weeping willows. A plot patiently awaits a baby's arrival, crosses climbed upon and helped by death like a puppy lapping at your thigh. Harvested grapes fall, fail to ferment while baby blue gets plucked from your vine, a dry taproot unrooted, silver leaving an untended mound. After the spiral, sinking into the recovery room bed of flung dreams and Cuban cigars, reunited with a grandfather who's hiding from Castro in clouds, holding your water, and a grandmother unaccustomed to losing her wardrobe, once fled to America, fearing her own nakedness. Your mother, a lover more manic, then the battle plans of Che made love to stuffed turkeys to the scent of cheap beer and overpriced tequila. You live only once, so take a chug, her virgin cry. The pain in her belly became your sinews. I, the muscle and bones they held together after sex bloodied us both. When junipers flourish in spring, offering our garden ground cover, we'll plant bamboo shoots at baby's headstone to hide the white coldness that takes our breath without permission. I thought disappointment could hide in the weeds, burn like sage, it smudged me till I choked. Somehow, I knew loving ceased, and the fucking had just begun. So I hung around a while in that tropical depression. At least water whipped about. We could gulp the sky and stars, weave baskets out of the river's current of ribbons, the ocean it fed our fabric burning everything before burning out. Death got naked for us like family ghosts, swooned our son to dryness. This poem is entitled Nothing for Joe Guevara with an epigraph from Fernando Pessoa. Life hurls us like a stone, and we sail through the air, saying, look at me move. What is poetry when it is small? Curled around the lungs of some small kid, silliness in every breath, and all in every moment. What is poetry when it is needed? When their mother's lips launched last night into porcelain. When responsibility is wider than their wingspan. What is poetry? When each word lifts, leaves their pen and lifts a weight from their stem when it fuels the morning struggle, when it functions as a king. What is poetry when it bursts 
through the door, staggering and solid, all leather and ink, when it's with its fist in the air, when it sings life into rooms packed with people waiting for their turn, and captures their ears or rooms sparse and cold and sparks each human match. What is poetry when it scoops a kid up with its hand caked in grease and oil, pulls them out of bed, yanks the word from their throat like a bucket from a well, makes them beg for it, makes them dream. What is poetry when it rattles, when it roars, when it smokes and hollers, swears and spews poison and hope in equal measure? What is poetry when it rages on raw meat, splits the hardwood floorboards, breaks the mic with a whisper? When it lifts an audience from their seats, and the chorus of applause threatens the eardrum. What is poetry when it moves too quickly to see? When it snaps at your neck with a Leonardo <coughs> jaw? When it steals your heart? What is poetry when it is an offer guaranteed for life and non-refundable when it carries no ulterior motive, when it is not for the sake of itself, but the sake of others. What is poetry when it is planted in a place that does not seem to want it, and grows like a weed, glows like a lamp in the fog, attracting new poets like flies? What is poetry as a carpenter, when it raises a community like the walls of a home, when it raises a kid full of anger and fear and shows them how to bleed, hands them a brush, a bandage, a blank page. What is poetry when it is a teacher, a father, a mentor, a friend, what is poetry when it means more to you than any living thing? What is poetry when live feels like a word insufficient to describe what he did? What is poetry doubled over, writhing in its bed when its eyes are closed with the force of pain instead of sleep? What is poetry when it spits in the face of death? What is poetry when it pisses on the feet? What is poetry when it rides with abandon, without destination? When it refuses to tip over and rust? When it fights with a fist made of metal and metaphor? When it fucking breathes fire, baby? What is all this without you? Hello, I'm, I'm glad to be here and thank you to Chase and Martine for putting this together. Joe is one of my best friends, uh, hands down, one of my dearest people in my life. So the poem I'm about to read isn't necessarily happy or hopeful, but I, I hope and I know, and please consider this kind of my unofficial promise, that I, I will go on to write poems um, that are hopeful and are happy, um, just this one's not, so. Change in altitude. My plane once plummeted into empty pockets of turbulence. Next to me, a Muslim woman trained her terrified gaze on me, clasped her hands, and chanted, and just like that, I knew. She must know the truth 
that we were all going to die. So to praise this life as ephemeral, that one more dip could take us all out. We can learn a lot about living from the dying. Right now on land, my friend has a shadow inside him, a dark blip in the radar screen that appeared after two years of cancer being in remission. And the doctors are trying to put him back on course. Chemo, radiation, he's trying to keep his arms out stiffly to remain alight as this nimbus migrates through him. And I do not want to stand by and watch this perfectly good human life led by this perfectly good human steadily plummet to the ground or flame gracefully into the ocean or clumsily taxi to a halt. I do not want to be the fool who prays for him any more than listen to the buzzsaw, the thud of plywood splitting off, the sound when half of my heart breaks away from the other. When he tells me that he can no longer mount his Harley that chugged and sputtered like a stoked red dragon, he can sit in his garage and run his fingers against the cool chrome he cannot feel. And I do not want to be the fool suspended in midair with him between life and death when he says, I'm going to say what I want from now on. I could be dead in a year. I can only white knuckle the armrest praying he will land safely in a light-filled deciduous knoll where the trees part, like saplings, to make way for one more life that will not be replaced by dust, squalling infants, by the salt of my useless tears. I have to watch this crone called gravity tear at him with her knobby knuckles. I have to see what comes, the slow chugging, the terrifying halt, what I know is the soul soaring above cumulus. I don't want to believe he's my mentor instructing me on how to live. Instead, I'm going to recall the pot we smoked in his van, the caramelized apple pie on the mode we shared with fierce intensity. The way I gripped his arm, refusing to dig out my fingers, hoping the tiny half moons would light his way on this dark ride, while the air around us grows thinner and thinner. Surprise! 
So there it was, official, on a tag with frostbite, a gift, this brand name bite from Sam. Red chrome, quiet, and too cold and snowy to ride today. I don't know either why St. Nick is so sneaky, <laughs> nor why every Christmas, no or no, the low rider is fired up, taken out of the garage, riding it like it was stolen. Protected by the pitted chrome of an angel's bell, this machine, these tribal metallic flames, red and roaring, the chrome, black leather bags and loud pipes, all do what the 10 speed couldn't. Ride this day, Christmas, with coal in my saddlebags, leather armoring my torso, and appendages, a brain bucket on my head and the moisture of winter's air cool upon my face. Home is great. 
reverend that speaks to, among other things, where Joe has gone, according to his sister, and it's called invocation. And we are invoking Joe, his persona. The other is, Joe has a very down, blue sense of humor. All right? And uh, he loved to ridicule the absurd. And so the other poem is humorous in that vein. How many would like to hear the humorous poem? <laughs> remember Sarah Palin? <laughs> you remember when she tried, she wanted to have a, a book band when she was a, a politician in uh, yeah, in Alaska? Uh, all of the off-color words mentioned in this poem, this is the kind of poem that I told you I'm not to write. It's a punchline poem. <laughs> All right, uh, are in the 10th edition of the Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. Does your, does Sarah Palin wants to ban a book, is the title. Does your dictionary have bullshit in it? Mine does. And let's see, another B word, S-O-B, two C words, the D word, two P words, the F word, c -S -er, and m -S -er two. I'm telling you, <laughs> look, I'm talking about a book that builds itself the voice of authority. <laughs> the most outrageous claim I've ever heard. So it's got seniority. So what? Big deal. What's real is that it's also got unheard of swears, corrupting, dirty talk, and whatnot. Words so off color, so blue, I've never read nor heard one or two. And more words for sex and whore than you ever heard before. <laughs> except for the profuse store of preceding all American colloquial lore we use to term blacks. This big red book's got words and terms so freaking bad, some should be deemed the worst illegal linguistical immigrants we've ever had. <laughs> terms like to go down on, to give tongue and such, too much. <laughs> the kinds of terms that could corrupt our young, impregnate our teenage daughter's mind. <laughs> Look, I'm talking about bookshelf right up there by the Bibles in your left wing bookstore. Right. What is this country coming to? I'm telling you. Word for word, it's the dirtiest book in the land. Mary Webster's Collegiate Dictionary should definitely be back. <laughs> Up and up in hospital. 
The air is shrilled with pain there, glaring white. Time is something you're fitted into, locked by pills and the busyness of nurses who come to take blood pressure whenever you manage to sleep. Here in hospice, your, gray, your face is gray as lichen, but you're lively, ridiculously so, with death hovering over you, a black helicopter waiting to land on your chest. Fast, faster you talk to us, words tumbling over themselves, water rushing over stones, words were pleasure and weapons. Now they spurt from you as you sense they will die with you. No time to say them all. <laughs> one more short one. When a friend dies, the salmon run no fatter. The wheat harvest will feed no more bellies. Nothing is won by endurance except endurance. A hunger sucks at the mind for gone color after the last bronze chrysanthemum is withered by frost. A hunger drains the day, a homely sore gap after a tooth is pulled. A red giant gone nova, an empty place in the sky, sliding down the arch after Orion and night sky as wide as a sleepless staring eye. When pain and fatigue wrestle, pain wins. The eye shuts, then the pain rises again at dawn. At first you stare at it, then it blinds you. I'm so happy to be here to celebrate uh, Joe's life, his amazing poetry, and um, South Asia's, with Josie's permission, uh, became our baby. Um, working with him on this book was a tremendous experience for me. We argued, we arm wrestled, and we compromised. One of the things that he wanted, and we talked about whether he should have a title of poem in the book. And I said, no, Joe, I have a poem called South Asia. I'll read that. So here it is, South Asia. There is a certain freedom and power that glass has that makes me jealous of sand. That it allows itself to be transparent, fully exposed, and truly seen, like the woman who sits proudly, her crotch fully exposed, as if privacy doesn't matter. There is a kiss, a city cab, and the edge of night precariously balanced that makes us hush and walk cautiously among them, daring us to touch, warning us, don't touch. It is the voice of sand that echoes here, missing the sea. One of the things that I'll never forget uh, just saying uh, to me was how Savage uh, and working on this book helped him and Josie focus on something other than his time. That somehow working on this brought them even closer together. So it was a tremendous privilege for me. Cast of characters. It all began here, in the home I grew up in. A perfectly neat home on the outside. Prim, perfect paint job, whitewash, glossing over marks where balls had hit. The lawn, mowed in dual directions, was to be kept off of leaving us to play in the streets. First, wiffle ball, graduating to stick ball. By the time we were eight, it was street baseball. The fire hydrant, first base. 
the seagulls shed staying in the middle of the road second. The sidewalk end of our front door walkway third. The next batter home plate. But by dinner time, everyone would be home on the inside. Homework, assignments, house chores, and everything else that had to be done today in order to have permission to play tomorrow. But first, there would be the family dinner table. Everyone had to be accounted for before a fork was lifted. I can still see the face of my sister, the one who hated peas after the laughing, telling her we had been one in her mashed potatoes she had just <laughs> taken a spoonful of. It was that same look Albert had on his face, turning third while looking back, making sure he had enough time to get home safely, before and instead watching a miraculous act made by my diving face first into asphalt. We played hard, as hard as I taught us to work, and the games didn't stop in the streets. That was just where we melted our metal. At the dinner table was where we poured, we poured it into the molds that would cast our characters. Mother would say, sit up straight, mind your manners, and keep your elbows off the table. That rule never seemed to apply to buy. He leaned into his food, using his elbows as a cane, fixed in one spot, as if buried into the wood like Arthur's sword in that stupid rock. I still say he probably had that same look on his face when he pulled it out as my sister did after eating that pea. <laughs> Not even whitewash could cover up those kinds, those kind of flaws, especially the callus on Guy's elbow the scan on mine, and the mysterious friends that hid behind them. I say I love you, but she's not buying. 
She hands me an envelope of consolation, speaks the words, our child. I see her, age two, seven, ten, sweet sixteen, and say nothing. Still staring, I wonder if she is peering into my darkness or opening her shutter, shedding light on this still life. Turning from me fast, his 92-year-old agrarian body 
as toiled as his farmland, ran like pigs at time of slaughter. My ears tasted the moonshine of his gasps and titters, a bloodshot of eyes chased after his mouth, knowing how spirits served inhibitions. Navigating through the maze of corridors, concrete crumbling as he passed through, fear hugged my head in the form of forearms, protecting a cradled newborn, first generation. I must have looked the way he did en route to America, when a Nazi warning shot forced the ship's anchor, bullets as boarding passes. No one ever knew if the shark's teeth were sharpened by the bones of the innocent, or their stomachs fed the flesh of enemies of state. Saving their hides held priority over saving face. Sacrifice sustained their faith. With search and seizures done, the charted course to American dream again begun. Factory work brought the farm, ranch animals fed the mill, gears of muscle and sinew, lubricated with sweat, kept the assembly line of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, producing wool. But first, Vavu had, had to hit land. He, pro he processed like goat's cheese, labeled with a last name minus two vowels and a consonant. He cured in America, built a white picket fence around his dream. Now he entered mine, damning my walls. As they crumbled, amused by his wake, unable to resist this hot pursuit, running through the glass door marked swimming pool, glass shards digging into my calves. I reached for him, panting, finally drinking in his eyes, begging for answers. El falu inglés, perfectly at pool's edge. Go, live your life as I live mine now. Jumping into the low end of this chlorinated water, he splashes incessantly, disinfecting my wounds, laughing hysterically. This is a poem in a similar vein. Um, a little translation is, Vavo means grandmother in Portuguese. How can you be Portuguese? You have no hair on your chin, he said through a well-greased sneer. I bit my coarse bread and chewed my tongue until it bled Portuguese. I wiped the memories from my mouth and smiled at him. I felt the history of my Vavo standing behind me, brandishing paring knives and cutting board shields. These vavos who fed you, dressed you, cleaned your plastic sick trays, folded your dirty sheets with a resolution of fingers on rosary beads, and you never thanked them for bringing you back from the dead. My Marias ruling their families with a wooden spoon scepter from a third floor apartment roosting on the sooty Somerville skyline, a heaven where the water ran wine in this rented patch of cement. My vavos brought these letters back to my seven-year-old mother to translate through horrified dictionaries. My mother attempted to preserve her mother's dreams of this America, with money ripening on trees, diamond commercials strung around thin necks with no concept of famine, tongues never tasting the iron tang of tyranny, the road systems of roller coasters with wealthy merchants selling monolingual storylines, Marilyn Monroe, all year round fruit, tweeze souls and expensive plane tickets home. This America where businessmen wrote thank you notes to their Portuguese speaking chambermaids in English. My vovó is going to night school, taking care of children, laundry carefully clipped to the top line waiting for the morning sun. My vovó's shawls protecting their children from slimy mouths like yours. My vavos fighting in factory lines to feed their friends and families overseas. Vegetable soup ladled into bowls, its steam fending off rogue secretarial paths. My vavos never sleeping, hands arthritic with prayer, so I could be a poet one day and finally stand up for them in a language that you understand. Nada é impossível, my vavó once said to me. Only the strong survive. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I want to thank all who organized this today, and Martine and uh, John and the uh, Cultural Center here. It's a great honor and very humble to be here. Um, I first met Joe in about 2000, 
four, I think, he, um, he applied to the New England College MFA program. I called him up to accept him. And I'll never forget his response. Uh, I, and now I told him that uh, he'd been accepted into the program. He said, I just really need to come to this program. Please admit me into this program. I'll send, I'll ask him. Um, I have many teachers who still will write recommendations. I said, Joe, you've already been accepted into the program. <laughs> uh, and um, it was a long pause, and he then thanked me profusely. He came to the program, and I think it changed his life. He met many people there. He was really eager to meet Anne Waldman there, and I think she really helped change his life. And uh, we returned here to Cape Cod, started his radio program, and um, continued to meet folks and, and grow as a poet, as a voice. Uh, when I think of Joe, I think of Whitman, one of his favorite poets, uh, a pre uh, saying, a saying of, of a section from his preface to a uh, song of myself, uh, go, go freely with powerful, uneducated persons. Joe went powerfully um, with uneducated persons and became your teacher. And um, I think uh, he did that in a way that was remarkable. He had so many different souls in him uh, that, we, that were expressed through his unique voice. And Galway Canal just uh, passed away uh, two days ago. And he said that, um, and when I asked what, what poets should do, he said a poet can perform a greater task than to witness to what is happening on Earth at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Joe certainly did that and taught us how to do it. Um, I'm going to read one of Joe's, I think one of his favorite poems, I think it was. He read this many times, and I'm not certainly going to do justice to it, because every time I see, saw Joe reading this poem or performing it, he was on his motorcycle, and uh, <laughs> he was performing, he was this character. And you know, Joe had a transformative spirit he transforms um, language and character in this poem. Evil to evil. You stare death down over drag bars and cars, 10, 15, 20 at a time, launch greatness from ramps of ambition, grit and metal, breaking records and 40 bones. You descended, you denied death for better job opportunities. When the night officer tried his hand at poetry, nicknamed you evil because it rhymed with Knievel. Had he a clue, the couplet would race down the gauntlet of former bank robbers stealing fame to that name. You stole the show at Caesar's Palace, leaping the fountains of your youth, taking to the air, rubber side down, shiny side up, the landing through our American daredevil, clad in leather, armor of red, white and blue from the sparkle of chrome forever into the wild world of sports. 29 days comatose couldn't alter your eager ego. The surgical steel infused backbone refused to bend. With, <clears throat> with a will stronger than your welded frame, you fed wonder by the forkfuls to young boys dreaming of being evil. Of course, there was only one who can evil, man of steel and scar, superhuman and superhero. Not even the kryptonite of Snake River Canyon could dull your shine. You twisted the throttle over death's domain rose from the ruins and river the ferryman dared not cross, not even your look was defeated. The crashes could not kill, hepatitis could not kill, hard liquor and harder women could not kill, lung disease could not kill, you killed time and as time killed you, stalking your clock like a determined lover, you said you found God all of a sudden of him daily, forged your frail body to a kneeling in youth, jumping rattlesnakes and lions, fountains, cars, and canyons at 69, taking practice runs at a leap of faith. If Peter denied you passage, if your name doesn't appear in the Guinness Book of Celestial Records, we'll all look on and off from our meditative states, anticipating one last leap over God's gate. And if your soul crashes into his throne in a shooting star of painless bliss, a meteor showing a, a meteor shower of cosmic chrome, and lightning will forever highlight that long last leap into legend, leaving skid marks on the street of gold, and even God will cheer your name. Evil. <laughs> When Joe passed in May, I just, I thought of, of his wonderful title and his book 
And I could think of no other greater words than these from, from Gilgamesh uh, in, in remembering him. All that is left to one who grieves is convalescence. No change of heart or spiritual conversion, for the heart has changed and the spirit has converted to a thing that sees how much it costs to lose a friend. So I'd like to end with this very short poem. I think of Joe uh, um, writing this to us now, speaking this to us now. It's an inversion of the uh, Persephone story about eating the pomegranate in the underworld. Um, our pomegranate that he's left us here. So it's in his voice. I didn't send you the pomegranate to write about, but to eat. It is from this world where every seed counts for a day of life. Thank you. Last Rites by Jokabaya. But it's not called that anymore. Now it's the sacrament of the sick, which is kind of like renaming Walpole State Penitentiary to Cedar Junction. <laughs> it sounds prettier, audio, makeup, painting over my feelings about dying. Some people get a good couple months of quality life. Hard to tell, a medical opinion serving as a daily mirror to my own mortality. Don't go to sleep tonight. You might not wake up. Became my nightly mantras while meditating in the jellyfish position in an exclusive relationship with seeking peace while praying that I'm at least as cool with God as with a neighbor I never talked to, but always smile and wave to <coughs> Appreciate the beauty of their yard. Consider it art. Be grateful for the neighbor I have. Pray for their children. Pay them to shovel my snow and mow my lawn. You'll mow your own lawn soon. Prune, trim, edge, mow, rake, clean. You'll have the prettiest yard soon. Somehow I knew I wouldn't die, not yet. There was work left to be done. I would think of Maria, who went holistic, after told six months over 20 years ago. That'll be me someday, that'll be me. I change my diet, go vegetarian, eat strictly all natural, see what direction my body wants to move in organically. Forward motion, forward motion, move a muscle, change a thought. Nearly two years later, I wonder if the sacrament of the sick has expiration dates. Though I have no intentions of renewing before deadline, instead, I dance like a fool, sing even worse, laugh a lot more, and fall in love. On the day I was put into remission, I proposed. She said yes to no diamond, offerings no gold to bear. When we were married three months later, no one dared ask if we were rushing it. Because of previous divorce, instead of a church and altar, we had a minister and the beach. Daffodils, azaleas, rhododendrons, and daylilies. Much of the same of what I eat these days. <laughs> All because of divorce, no priest may marry us. He may only offer last rites. Excuse me. The sacrament of the sick. <laughs> but I am no longer sick. I am well on my way to wellness, already living my afterlife. You can't put a timeline on that, only a storyline, a plot with purpose, or whatever the hell else comes after last rites. <laughs> Good day, thank you. It's an honor to be here, an honor to be here share this with all of you. Joe and I were friends, brothers, bikers, travelers, unindicted and occasionally indicted co-conspirators. Um, I'm take a somewhat different turn. I'm going to read it from Riverside Down, the biker poet anthology. And these are what are called baiku. <laughs> we sort of came up with this in the Highway Poets Motorcycle Club, the International Association of Published Bikers, which we were members. Baiku 
A binder lyric verse, form having three unrhymed lines of five, seven and five syllables, traditionally invoked for an aspect of writing or biker life or referring in some way to the nature of writing or writing season. My crew. Steel, rubber, and chrome soaring through concrete jungles, thunderstorms roll in. Loud and proud straight pipes, illegal, the police say. I don't hear a word. <laughs> Jesus, she's dirty. Bugs and mud spatter my bike. Ah, riding season. <laughs> Shirt and tie man rides. He don't need no wrench at all, just a rice burner. Special construction, forks raked out six inch over ape hangers keep cool. Kickstand up, turn key, press starter button, no go. Hey, turn on the gas, dummy. <laughs> and finally, joys of a Harley, the road, the wrench, the ride, man, don't settle for less. <laughs> Joe brought me back from 35 years as a singer-songwriter. Uh, my return to poetry was reading at one of his open mics down in Prodigal Son. I had walked up to him at some point there and said, yeah, I just want to let you know, you know, I'm a poet, I'm thinking of coming, and he did exactly what you do if you were involved with poetry. You go, yeah, sure, you should do that, and walk away going, <laughs> And the beautiful part of this was when I read, he came over to me after I did the open mic and said, damn, you really are a poet. <laughs> This is uh, called Not Quite for Joe Go. Um, the epigraph is uh, a line from a friend of mine, Greg Greenway, who's a singer songwriter. We are kissed by the sweet brick of life. <laughs> I will dream about skeletons, loud Harleys that leak oil, the run from Cape Cod to Boston or up to Laconia for bike week. The red sled you bought that screamed through straight pipes and sprayed a fine mist of oil all over me as you darted ahead, wearing that I don't need a windshield bug tooth grin. <laughs> I've come back to an empty house after too many tequilas, 13 hours of driving and Chinese food. Why am I prepared for Mother's Day, but not the rest of a life where those of us that survive get the booby prize of watching others disappear into the ground like rain. And there will never be enough comfort food, enough warm embraces, or enough sexual gymnastics to erase the scraping pain of not getting to say goodbye one last goddamn time. devoted to the kind of poetry that Joe wrote, poetry that bears witness to injustice and provokes change. Joe came to our first festival in 2008 and animated the hell out of the proceedings. <laughs> We've now lost five people who were there. Joe, Galway Cannell, Patricia Monaghan, Henry Braun, and uh, the great South African poet, Dennis Brutus. And I like to think of the five of them in the beyond, kicking ass, and plotting the poetic revolution. I'm going to read Joe's poem, Red. 
between the first and second uh, split this rock, the, um, a reporter asked me, what's different from this first one? And I said, I need a different pair of glasses to read. <laughs> Time. Red. It races down the track, humming high notes to the finish line. It sounds off sirens, forcing you to the side of the road. At night, it becomes the scent of a lost Irish lover, the Liffey flowing down her back, cursing him with heartbreak. A flushed anger brought to surface serves discoloration of face, a pale thirst for the blood of a new lover. It is the sniffing, then sipping, of port wine drunk to unwind, window chime a melting candle, the pursing of lips, the parting of lips. An exit sign at the theater lights up, serving as entrance to a love scene repeated until the hearth has gone silent and all colors have resumed their duties. It is the bloody hand of God shaking my hand apologetically for creating such a mess. It is the hand of my mother cleaning. I, I want to give a special thank you to Maritza for this beautiful book. And Maritza, like Joe and like so many um, here in this room, were great. Um, supporters of other poets, as has been mentioned many times, and promoters. And so I um, honor being on Joe's radio show before that festival to help promote it. Um, and to, you know, participate in the contest, which I'm thrilled is now the Joe Gouveia contest. Uh, I'm going to um, read a poem and that of my own. It has um, Martina and I, uh, and my um, common friend, Dan Vera, is in the poem. Um, it's also dedicated to Jack Gilbert, who died in 2012, and it's in, I think, uh, Joe's spirit. It's called Burning and Splendor, and it has an epigraph uh, from Jack called, from Jack Gilbert, to make injustice the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. I'm hot, Dan's sister writes in his notebook. Then, I'm Cuban, rejoicing in her own wanton beauty, wired up in the ICU, glad and bountiful, the tube in her throat, refusing silence. Dan's sister dances in the ruthless furnace of this world, glad for Dan's arrival, though it frightens her that he's come so far. Glad for Dan's notebook he carries everywhere to record the burning and splendor of this world. Jack Gilbert died yesterday. Sorrow everywhere and suffering. But let us not praise the devil. Let us bring the notebook to Dan's sister. Let us declaim that in the furnace of this world she is Cuban. She is hot. Uh, thank you. Hello. I thank you so much for bringing this together. And it's, um, it's a great honor to stand here. I met Joe at the 2008 Split This Rock Festival, where he organized a panel on the rant which was fabulous, with Martine and Alicia Ostreicher and um, some others. It was amazing and we became friends. And I uh, was glad I had an opportunity to come back to the Fine Arts Work Center for Windsor and Provincetown and to reconnect and to get to know Joe a little better. Um, the last time I saw him was about a year ago around the corner here. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'm really glad for his book, and I want to read the last poem in the book, which I think is beautiful. The whole book is beautiful. Where Home Is has two epic 
the grass. Henry David Thoreau, a man may stand there and put all America behind him. And Fernando Pessoa, with our ships sailing to many ports, but not a single one goes where life is not painful. This is where I lay me down to sleep, not in the city nor its suburbs, but here in the sands of a beach town where natural beauty far exceeds fashion, where dirt roads first formed by horse and buggy later paved for automobiles, racing rum runners to moonshine used by Portuguese prohibition smugglers from province town to hide the goods, roads leading to the sea which salts our wounds like codfish sun-dried and preserved. Here, we don't live by hype, nor take subways to work. On our horizon, we see ships headed to back to port. On the way home from their work, fishing for cod, tuna, and a lifestyle defining us and our towns. Where we wait on rooftops, where the widow's walk got its name. Waiting to sight trawlers, telling whether a husband or a loved one made it back safely or died at sea. On this turf, life is a beach. A zillion grains of sand compose our national seashore, where wildfires and logging destroyed this once vibrant, exotic forest. Now sand dunes, where scrub pines spread, hugging the earth, holding her to fight off erosion. The way Portuguese widows hug, hug old widow wedding photos while waiting for a ship long overdue, never to return, left longing for their dead, what the people call saudades. In springtime, with controlled fires, we burn that shore, cleanse our sorrows, prevent wildfires while sustaining Gaia's fields, restoring vegetative communities, fostering berries to bloom during dormant season, oak saplings to re-sprout, pine seedlings established, Hotter fires destroy older canopies so that sunlight can shine on our forest floor while new growth is encouraged by burning dead wood and duff to protect our lives, property, and values while old shipwreck masts wave to firemen at low tide. These shores serving as vacation fun for tourists, life and death working conditions for local fishermen, graveyards for whales and dolphins, where yogis stretch out and Buddhists meditate. The rest of the universe is where we find home, our lives, that place where we turn our backs on the rest of the world. Breathe in the salt of our wounds. Mourn after the loss of even our moorings. Dive into that ocean of loss and longing. In it, make love. Cast a rod. Hope for a keeper. Find peace. Someone asked me, um, given all the commotion in Ferguson, someone said, have you written any poems about Ferguson? I said, I've been writing about Ferguson all my life. <laughs> I'm going to read Joe's poem, Class Struggle. I have one carpenter, an alcoholic, who's drinking again. He whacked his wife good, got a court date today. She may not show up if he goes back to AA. He's desperate now, so he's only smoking pot. 
Another lumper, a Vietnam vet, can only work alone. He's afraid of heights and can't be trusted near anyone with a hammer or nail gun. We use him for cleanups and dump runs. By the end of the week, the new kid from the tech who knows more than the rest will be fired. His dad used to beat him, won't be told what to do. He'll say his boss sucks and move to Florida. Summer, I'll hire that student from the community college whose dad was a carpenter and died when he was six. He is slow but meticulous, has a new girlfriend each week. He'll have one pregnant by August and transfer to full time. My foreman's in rehab, withdrawing from heroin and crystal meth. He's the best I've got. His wife picks up his checks. She says he was molested by a priest as a kid, that he's not a bad guy, if only he could stay clean. Before mid-spring, I'll need more help and hire half a dozen helpers unskilled from the labor temp agency. Two will work out and stick around for a while, unlike their parents, who too are in rehab. One new hire will learn fast, replace the foreman one day, thank me for teaching him a trade that pays and giving him a chance to prove himself, something the folks in the foster home never did. Others will quit, steal tools, start their own business, take down payments, never do the work. File for bankruptcy and keep the funds, pay off gambling debts instead of get rich quick. Some will be replaced by divorced union carpenters from the city who will say they moved to Cape Cod for the slower pace, asked to be paid cash under the table or can't work, while somewhere in Boston his kids are hungry. Another kid from the tech will eventually come along, hungry to show that he's one of the guys. He'll spend 10 minutes in the trailer looking for the witch stretcher the journeyman sent him for. <laughs> Next week, that same journeyman will cut off his finger on the table saw while wearing OSHA-approved eye goggles after bragging about the safety course he took and how many years' experience he has. Before the year is out and our building projects complete, complete the rookie will start dealing pot this summer, get arrested. The journeyman will switch careers selling insurance, and the foreman might not make it through withdrawals. Of those who stay on, all will ask for a raise. <laughs> when a poet dies, their words become luminous. Um, I'm a cancer survivor. Um, while Joe was going through his struggle with cancer, I was also going through my struggle with cancer, bladder cancer. And um, I've gone through two operations. My bladder is <coughs> cancer-free. Um, <laughs> but Joe and I traded emails about our individual struggles. And he reminded us, that he reminded me, he said, we're warriors. And uh, Joe was definitely a warrior. Um, poets are ministers and prophets, and the word is our claim. I'll leave you with this. Leaving them luminous. After my obituary, I'll be back. Standing under a streetlight, smoking a cigarette. Surrounded by history I left behind. Suited up in transparency, I'll let crowds pass through me as I whisper their futures in their ears. Send prayers to stop their shadows. After my obituary, I'll make strange things happen wherever writers and poets are gathered. I'll step into the cages of the beautiful and gifted, ignite their hearts like torches, exhaust them with my possession leaving them luminous with prophecy and madness. And finally, because I had to go through that whole mort mortality thing, I mean, I'm 65 years old, and you know, I have a daughter and a granddaughter, a five-month-old granddaughter, and um, when you, you know, Dennis Brutus's death put me on the floor, literally. It put me on the floor. A man was my mentor for 22 years. I published three of his books. Um, so I had, when they told me I had cancer, um, it was um, an unforgettable moment. Someday, someday I shall take my shadow 
like a shirt packed for traveling, like shoes and underwear thrown in a suitcase. Leave red trail of taillights in my wake. Start out on the journey back to the stars. Leave worries and blues for someone else to find. Get lost in the map my soul remembers. Track the vanishing of ancestors beyond the dream of time. Thank you. Every spring we have uh, an exhibit here called Mutual Muses, in which 50 poets respond to over 50 visual artists and vice versa. And Joe was always amused until this last spring when he could not participate because he was too ill. But this is a poem that he wrote for an earlier Mutual Muses. It is called What It Is. It's not about the fame. It's about graduating from shame rising rather phoenix-esque, from individual failure to heroic couplets, or couplets perhaps. Sometimes on a mediocre day, groups, 12-step groups, group therapy, anger management class, get rich quick class, trade school to academia to grad school, class of whatever, to a class of one's own. It all boils down to how you're known judged by what's left behind. Ahead is always an eventual stop, and you can only run so many of them before pulled over by the blues. Gee, why'd I never note that you just don't know what you don't know? And sometimes, even when you do, you don't and don't, because you do, sometimes confusing you, sometimes me. It's not about me, it's about we, what we do. Everything between you and me. The space between us no dirt can fill. Space measured in ripples, each outward advancement extending across an entire ocean. Some formed by tsunami, others by pebble. The motion is what matters, serving to measure what matters, having a name to attach to it, something to be remembered by. It's not about the fame, it's about something greater. And this is a short poem I wrote, inspired largely by Joe in his final days. It's called For Keeping. I've been told that wood burns as it does since trees for decades drink the sun and then in death, give it back in fire. So give me a pyre when I am done here, and watch as all I've known blooms up in flame. The white of a sparrow's chin, the plum of a stale bruise, a gold known only in August. How cinnamon rises like sweet smoke, freckles these apples, closes my eyes. Let me spend myself in the key of G, in cadmium red, in bird song and cold dirt after the field's been turned, in what I've loved, burning like a rainbow steeped in wine, burning like a cavalcade of suns, burning like your kiss, now mine, for keeping. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Martina Spada. I'm uh, the last poet of the afternoon. <coughs> Many thanks for doing. He was my great friend. 
And I want to invoke his spirit now. There is uh, something we do in uh, the Latino community, a uh, uh, call and response. Um, one person says the name, I would say the name, and then you would say, Presente. Present. So, we will do this three times. Jo Guevara. Presente. Jo Guevara. Presente. Jose Goea. This is Joe's poem, The Distraction. Let this be the story of the world, green grass, budding flowers, an unreachable horizon that we trudge toward together. Hold my hand. Kick off your footwear and step forward. Let's not do this alone. The horizon is always darkest because we can't see beyond it. Have faith. Mother says that God walks with us if we repent sincerely and Jesus will return when the world ends. Father says the world ends every day for somebody as he walks into the garage to prepare and prime the lawnmower for this new cutting season, pulling out the garden hose, attaching the new sprinkler. All this work in retirement, all these dreams of after. If there is a secret to this life, let it be flowers and grass, because when he said that the world would end next, not by flood, but by fire, it was because on God's green earth, growth is stronger and colors brighter after the first burn. Must be why. So much ore, all those fire bombs, and all that blood soaking the earth with the stuff of creation. Perhaps that is why some settle down to find sanity in an insane world. Let us embrace our joys now. Impatient for an end that comes as slowly as a single bare footstep among the wild fields. Take my hand, let us rest here, looking to heaven for answers, and each other for distraction. Next poem, this last poem, is a poem of my own. Um, and uh, I wrote it about a year ago. And I was uh, pleased and amazed when Joe decided to make it the introduction of his book, the entire introduction. And I have written many a forward and many an introduction for many a poet. Some of them are in this room. I have never been prouder of any introduction or any forward I have ever written. So, here's a poem. It's called, Here I Am, for José Jogo Goya. He swaggered into the room a poet at a gathering of poets, and the drinkers stopped crowding the cash bar. 
The talkers stopped their tongues. The music stopped hammering the walls. The way a saloon falls silent when a gunslinger knocks open the swinging doors. Jogo, grinning in gray stubble and wraparound shades, leather, Harley vest, shirt, yellow as a prospector's hallucination, sleeve buttoned to hide the bandage on his arm where the IV pumped chemo through his body a few hours ago. The nurse swabbed the puncture and told him he could go, and Joe Go would go, gunning his red van from the Cape to Boston, striding past the cops who guarded the hallways of the Grand Convention Center as if to say, here I am. The butcher's son, the Portuguese, the roofer, the carpenter, the cab driver, the biker poet. This was Jogo, who would shout his ode to evil Knievel in biker bars till the brawlers rolled in dear and broken glass, who married Josie from Brazil on the beach after the oncologist told him he had two months to live two years ago. That's not enough for me, he said. And we'll say again when the cancer comes back to coil around his belly and squeeze hard like a python set free and starving in the swamp. He calls me on his cell from the hospital and I can hear him scream when they press the cold x-ray plates to his belly, but he will not drop the phone. He wants the surgery. Today, right now, surrounded by doctors with hands, blood speckled like the hands of his father, the butcher sawing through the meat for the family feast. The patient's chart should read, This is Jogo. After every crucifixion, he snaps the cross across his back for firewood. He will roll the stone from the mouth of his tomb and bow a strike. On the night he silenced the drinkers chewing ice in my ear, a voice in my ear said, What the hell is that man doing here? And I said, That man there? That man will live forever. <laughs>